These are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to ExamSoft's webinar today. Um, it's called Healthy Assessment, What Nursing Schools Can Teach Us About Effective Assessment of Student Learning. Um, this webinar is hosted by Dr. Douglas Ader, um, who spent a majority of his career as a biology faculty member and assessment expert at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Um, he spent some time uh, doing sabbatical research at UT Health Science Center in Dallas and at the Bishop Museum in Honolulu. I can't talk today. Um, he was also the Emerson Visiting Distinguished Scholar at Hamilton College um, between 2000 and 2001, and he held admin positions at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville, Arizona State, University of North Florida, and he was recently um, quote unquote assessment coach at Purdue University. He's now a consultant with the Idea Center, um, and he's also been doing some work for ExamSoft lately. Um, we um, commissioned him to do a really cool study about um, assessment in nursing schools and how nursing schools um, conduct assessment and how their performance on conducting assessment compares with other types of schools and colleges that are found within the institution. Um, so today he's going to tell us about what nursing schools are doing um, and his conclusions about nursing schools are pretty positive. So I'm going to hand this over to him. Doug, you can take it away. Thank you, Ken. Uh, this is Douglas Hayden, and I'm talking to you from the uh, beautiful prairies of western Illinois, where it's a wonderful clear day with a gentle breeze and clear blue skies. I first of all would like to make sure that the chat area works. And so uh, would any or all of you at least enter a little bit in the chat area. I do not know how many people are out there, but I do need to make sure that the chat area works and that I can see your responses because we're going to be using that chat area. So for those of you who have computer access, uh, please uh, enter a couple of letters. Um, just a hello uh, is all I need to make sure that the chat works. Go ahead. And I don't see anybody saying anything. Hey, and Doug, if I can jump in some... one second. Um, for yeah. everybody in the audience, the chat feature um, that Dr. Ader is talking about is in the GoToWebinar control panel over on the right side of your screen. There should be a tab that says chat, and you can just talk right there. A couple of you are talk are inputting questions in, but I don't see them. Okay, so I'm hesitating right now with uh, dead air time uh, because I don't see any response, and therefore uh, I don't know whether what I'm saying is getting out to anybody. I so am I getting talking into a. Go ahead, Ken. Um, I am getting some responses on this end. Um, whenever we get to the slide that has those, can I just read those responses to you, Dr. Hader? Because Thank I am you. seeing responses uh, on my end. Good. I get no responses here. My next question, uh, Ken, for you is roughly how many computers are hooked up to this right now? Um, I see. How large is the audience? I see at least seven, not including you and me. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, I'll proceed on the basis that these people are um, watching and listening. And if there are um, questions or comments, that they will indeed communicate to you, and then you can voice over and interrupt me appropriately. Um, I've been Perfect. in assessment since about the beginning uh, in 1985, and therefore I'm uh, one of the, I guess, pioneers or certainly explorers of assessment. I'm a regular with Trudy Bonta's uh, annual assessment institute and uh, have been to all, well, 22 of the 23 um, sessions that she's had. I do, was not around for the first one, but I was for everything since, including this year coming up. The commissioning of this particular investigation or study uh, has given me no monetary rewards. In other words, I'm about to define what ExamSoft did to commission. What ExamSoft did was it gave me a list of nursing schools that use ExamSoft software. But other than that, ExamSoft has neither directed 
nor specified what I am to do or exerted any sort of intellectual or financial control over what I'm about to reveal. So this is an independent study with a single exception that they gave me a list of schools that use ExamSoft or have at least inquired about ExamSoft software. I have, as a biomedical scientist, I have taught anatomy and physiology for over 30 years and probably produced about 3,000 nurses, about 300 physicians, and a whole couple score of veterinarians, pharmacists, and other allied health professionals. But because I've been working with nursing schools more than other components of universities, uh, I am particularly sensitive to and, ad and, and admire especially what nurses learn and what they do. One of the things that I have found is that nursing schools tend to do and use assessment in ways that other disciplines tend not to. And so during the interviews that I did, I have found that nurses in particular are able to succeed because they communicate the standards and expectations. There is a general faculty consensus about what assessment is to do. They provide remarkable feedback to students in ways that other components of an institution do not do. They do frequent and announced and visible curricular checkups to use the information. And they do it for what I'm going to call the right reasons, namely the reasons that those of us who were in at the beginning used assessment to do, namely to communicate and do this for our students. So those are the five takeaways over on the left lower corner of the screen. And we'll go through these a bit at a time. The interviews themselves. I interviewed 19 nursing schools that are useful in this study. Actually, I interviewed more, but for technical reasons, we're not using the results from two of them. Uh, by technical reason, um, one of the technical reasons could be that uh, the people who I interviewed were not qualified to answer the questions, and we found out about this afterward. That kind of technical uh, process. Uh, the nursing schools are nationwide. I chose them. Um, they represent large and small, public, private, four-year, two-year. And I asked them seven open-ended questions plus five multiple choice follow-up questions, which in some cases were necessary, and usually interviewed a different respondent than for the first time. This reason for the seven open-ended questions were to save the time of the person I was interviewing. The analysis was done through simple content analysis of the open-ended responses. Here's the list of the participating schools. The 19, you can see that they are technical schools, upper division nursing schools, community colleges, a large private university, large public university, small tribal college, and so on. I wish to thank publicly these institutions for making their in, uh, information available. And uh, all the results you will see will be in the aggregate. I will not identify any particular result with any particular university or college. Uh, Ken, I need your help because what I would like to hear is at least some examples of what the members of the audience think. What questions would they have offered in order to find out why nursing schools are able to assess student learning so effectively? More so in general than arts and sciences, more so in general than business, more so in general than engineering and education, and so on. So I'm just looking for a couple of examples of questions that they think, if they were in charge of this sort of interview, what questions would they ask in order to find out why nursing schools assess effectively? And so I'll wait for a couple of examples to come through. And if you just relay, relay them to me, please. I'm waiting on my end, Doug. Um, again, okay. everybody in the audience, if you will type in um, a response to the question on your screen in the question box over on the right-hand side of your screen.
Okay, first one here. I'm ready. It's, do you have to report your program outcomes to accrediting bodies that hold you accountable for student outcomes? Got it. That's an interesting question. And I did not use that as it was given. Um, I used a modification of that. Uh, but that's an important thing to find out. And you'll see why it's important in a minute, because that, that discussion is the response to the very first question that I actually did ask. Anything else, else coming through? Um, another one that came through that it's kind of in the same vein. Um, it's at my school, we have to um, report back to a national um, accrediting body that dictates adequate assessment and what assessment means at our school. Excellent, and you're right. Uh, I interpret it uh, as uh, being very much like the first one. Um, I, this is a rhetorical question. I am not asking for identification, but I would like to know um, just just in in, in a, a private thinking as to what kind of institution um, responded to these first two questions. If it was a nursing school that responded, or a different kind of school. Again, this is a rhetorical question only. I'm not looking for any identification. Uh, because this kind of question is exactly what I actually did ask, was designed to find out, and the results to me were startling. I'm going to move to the next image. Thank you for those two questions. Here are the seven questions I actually did ask. In question one, for whom do you assess and why? In other words, if you're doing all this assessment, why are you doing it? Second question is, what do you assess? In other words, what are they trying to monitor? Third question is, you have this information on how do you manage it? You use software, graduate assistants, um, faculty. The fourth question, what artifacts do you capture, such as student projects, portfolios, simulations, exams? Questions five and six are, to me, the key, because these two questions are the major reason that assessment uh, visits by accrediting agencies fail. Namely, the feedback is not used. So I wanted to ask, how do you use the feedback for the program? And question six, how do you use the feedback for the students? Question seven has to do with the notion of something that I have watched in terms particularly of, um, I'm watching right now with the people building a house across the road from us. But I've also watched it at university construction sites. The people who do building may or may not have college education, but they are not permitted to have a grade of C or a grade of D plus in constructing a house or a residence hall or a classroom building. Everything has to be done perfectly. There are no 78%. There are no 89%. They have to be 100% right. And that type of learning in academic environment is called mastery level learning. So I would like to know how the nurses, who also teach for mastery level learning, how do you use assessment to do that? <clears throat> it was necessary to do follow-up questions, particularly to find out what kind of software was being used for software assistance. And so I did ask five, multiple, five um, software questions, usually by asking a different individual. Not always, and sometimes the Follow-up was not necessary. But we asked five software questions, and at the appropriate time, we'll go through these again individually as well. Because of the chat room difficulty, and the, I cannot see it, um, I'm not going to take the time to ask for chat responses. But question one, for whom do you assess? Why are you doing this? And so my question to those of you in this audience, what do you think the nursing school said? And what they actually said, 100% of the nursing schools responded, we're doing this for our students. We want to make sure that our students are doing well. I don't mean that they're succeeding academically, but we want to make sure that they're not going to kill patients. But this is so important that we're doing an assessment for our students. Now, this is remarkable. And it was oftentimes the first thing that the nursing school said. They didn't do it for the accreditors. At least that's not what they reported. Yes, the accreditor is important. But 
50% of the schools mention the accreditor, whereas 100% mention the students. The second most popular response is, we're doing this for ourselves, for our program, for our university to make sure we're doing our job. And again, this is a very different sort of response than I get when I ask this question of arts and sciences, for example, who almost invariably start out the way the two responders did. Do we have to report this? Does our creditor require this? Yes, that's why we're doing it. So there's a major difference. Question two, what do you assess? And the overwhelming response is that nursing schools are interested in assessing mostly clinical judgment and critical thinking, accounting for over 90% of the responses, where communication, certainly between nurse and patient, and also between nurse and physician and other members of the healthcare team, that's also important. The disciplinary skills were not the first thing mentioned, nor were they mentioned in every conversation that I had. But certainly, critical thinking and clinical judgment ranked number one. The third question was, how do you manage the data? If all this data comes through, how do you deal with it? And the nursing schools said, over 60% of them, these numbers, by the way, are rounded. We do it by hand, or we use local spreadsheets. Only about one-fifth of them said, do we use electronic surveys? And again, one-fifth of them said, we use university surveys or university software system for assistance. But the overwhelming majority of the nurses said, we're using by hand, we're using spreadsheets local to our computers. I explored this further because this was the reason for the follow-up questions. If you use software, what software do you use? ATI is the Assessment Technology Institute. ExamSoft accounted for one-fifth of the universities and colleges in the survey to begin with. HESI is the Higher Education Systems Incorporated. Uh, it's out part of Elsevier. LMS is Learning Management Systems. That's Atrixware. PAR System, that's Scantron. Locals, and then none of the above. And then none of the above usually uh, included mention of Task Stream, Kaplan, Moodle, Desire to Learn, EBI, which is the Educational Benchmarking Institute, and Tyson, one response each. Exploring the software further, what are you using for curriculum review and planning? ExamSoft, which is partly designed and advocated by its makers, accounted for 15% of the responses, but the other responses really were not organized by the software manufacturer, and they were just used sort of adventitiously with none of the above accounting for 60% of the responses. Individually mentioned were SQL, Excel, Access with one response each. What software system do you use for reaccreditation? Well, again, ExamSoft was part of the sample group, and so 5% of the responses from that. Local software, 20%, but again, the overwhelming majority is we don't use any of it. Individually mentioned were SQL and EBI. What specific purpose do you use? And when we talked about a specific software system, I would then probe further and say, what do you actually use it for? Remediation of the at-risk students and identification of at-risk students account for, by far, the heavy majority of the uses, with routine assessment accounting for about one quarter of the responses, and the rest you can see. The bottom response should be 6.0. There should be no 60. It should be 6. None of the above accounts for 6% of the responses. The reasons for none of the above were our system is evolving or we're moving from one system to another. Suppose 
And because multiple responses are possible, suppose more than one software system is in use. How valuable would intercommunication be? You can see that the big response is no expected noticeable difference. In inquiring further, the nurses reported that their priorities were caring for students and caring for patients, and they didn't have time or interest in playing with software. And so the communication between software systems wasn't because it wasn't valuable, but their interpretation was, we don't have time to find out if it would be valuable. Moving on to the interview, what kinds of assessment artifacts? Again, the heavy majority of the artifacts that nursing schools collect is based on exams and exam performance, with observations in the clinical simulator accounting for about three quarters of the responses and direct observations in the clinic for way over half. Student papers, standardized patients, the nursing labs, projects, and other items account for the rest. The other items that are not shown include concept maps, portfolios, posters, capstones, presentations, care plans, case studies, and journals, all less than 30%. Now we get to the two key questions, because in the United States in particular, assessment is regarded as a pariah. and Again, in the United States in particular, students are not performing as well as they are in numerous other countries outside the United States. Part of the problem, at least in my hypothesis and observations of doing this for 25 years, is that we do assessment to satisfy the accreditor rather than to provide feedback to the system and to the students. And so I ask these two questions to get at that and have a conversation about those topics. The question five has to do with the program and the faculty, and question six is the same question focused on the students. Let's deal with question five. How does the feedback get to on the students get back to the faculty and the program? Nursing schools tend to have individual instructors report to the faculty itself, oftentimes as part of a self-improvement plan for that faculty member. So Faculty members are in the habit of having self-improvement plans for teaching, and they report on student learning as part of that self-improvement plan. Now, I've talked most recently at a social gathering with a former chancellor of a university, and when we talked about this kind of response, he says, well, Doug, you, you realize that nursing deans are less deans of an academic program than they are the head nurse. And nurses are used to and have a culture of reporting to the head nurse. So the culture of a nursing program, emphasized through this conversation, is that nurses are used to and have a culture of self-improvement. They have to in order to remain in a hospital, because hospitals require basically 100% performance. Again, no grades of C plus or B minus. It is we have every patient that comes in that is supposed to live, will live, and will exit safely. And so self-improvement plans at the academic level for the nursing culture are pretty much in parallel with the kinds of expectations that happen in the clinical setting. The other major way of getting feedback on student performance is through some sort of end of semester or end of month committees that review the work. Other mechanisms include uh, written student course evaluations, or on-site evaluations. Uh, two programs said the feedback comes through one main person, presumably the dean. Uh, one institution said through a larger institutional mechanism that does not directly involve the nursing school. And one institution said via e-portfolios. But by far the majorities were through two major formal systems that are listed on the screen. The parallel question is, how does feedback get to students? And the feedback gets to students. The interesting thing is that students, almost two-thirds of them, have direct access to a publisher, computer-based feedback system. 
they do not have to go through the faculty. And so the feedback is available, the assessment feedback is available through a software system. Now, in slightly under half of the cases, students do receive individual feedback from professors. And that is indeed something that's expected in nursing school. A third large scale mechanism is that students, unlike in other disciplines, serve regularly on nursing school committees along with the faculty and therefore receive information in group form. Now, again, multiple responses are possible. And so it is certainly the, the numbers that you see on the screen add up to way more than 100%. That's because there are multiple mechanisms for feedback to students. Commentary on that individual direct access. Faculty members do not have to participate with the students in order for them to have feedback on their exams or on their papers or on anything else which is put into the system. The students can get it directly. And if students are having difficulty in one clinical area, they can get additional tutoring without going through a human being. It's done through software. This is not the same as exists in other disciplines, particularly in the arts and sciences. And so again, to continue my commentary, it might be that the student performance and the faculty participation and assessment in nursing is enhanced through the software because faculty members can indeed and can and indeed do spend time with students, but it is not required in every instance for students to receive feedback only by consulting with faculty members. They are expected to do it themselves. That is a special difference. And I think, again, to continue my commentary, it counts in part for nursing student performance and for faculty members' acceptance of and participation in assessment. End of commentary. Well, question seven has to do with how do these students that perform at such a high level um, airplane pilots, again, are not uh, permitted to have grades of C minus on their skills and disposition. They must be perfect or else people will not fly in airplanes. 100% of all airplane landings must be perfect. And by perfect, I mean the equipment and the passengers have to be ready to fly after being on the ground. You cannot have damaged passengers and you cannot have damaged equipment. So how do nurses perform at this high level? So I ask the people I was interviewing, how do you accomplish this and use your assessment to assure that? 80% of them said we have multiple methods. They do not rely on a single assessment method, but they have multiple methods. About half of them said that there is a capstone or a critical element, for example, nursing medication. Oftentimes, students must score 100% on their nursing medication and mathematical skills before they're permitted to go to the next stage. So there are certain things, gatekeepers, somewhere in the curriculum where students must be perfect in order to be permitted to go onwards. Half of the school said that there were capstones or critical elements that were essential for that to happen. 15% exit exams and others. Now the interpretation. One, nursing school success at least partly depends that they do it for the reasons originally intended. That is, they do it for the students. Back in the 1980s, this is the reason we set up assessment programs to begin with. And this was the original emphasis. It is not to satisfy the accreditors, it is to help the students learn better. When students learn better, the accreditors will automatically be satisfied. The nursing faculties, as a culture, tend to agree on what is important in the curriculum. And this, in my view, differs than what exists in most arts and sciences and other faculties. Nurses know what's important. Again, the dean oftentimes is regarded as the head nurse, at least according to the tale told to me by one chancellor. And therefore, they tend to agree on what is important in the curriculum in the same way that the degree is what is important in the, in the clinic. This is not the case in other disciplines, or certainly less the case. Nursing schools reported that they assessed what matters to them. 
And their number one thing is clinical judgment and critical thinking. And so they go for that first. The other things are important. Leadership, working as a team, but they don't spend time with that the way they do with critical thinking and clinical judgment and communication. This means that they're assessing what matters not only to the student success, but also to the faculty. And if it matters to the faculty, they do it. The feedback to the students and their opportunity to get better is critical to this success. And without the immediate feedback to the students and to the faculty, assessment tends not to flourish. And it turns out that because of the computer software and the availability of tutorials online, the students gain access to this without taking faculty time. The nursing schools happen to do a lot of their processing by hand, in part because they're involved with activities that they see as more important. There's a consequence to this. They do it by hand because it's important, but there's a large gap because the nursing schools reported struggling with their data. Therefore, there is a large opportunity for technological assistance. It is certainly possible to help facilitate the assessment work, but the nurses are so occupied with caring for their own patients and their own professional care and caring for students that they have not in the past had time to deal with these other things. And so they report struggling with the data. Which brings me to the end of my presentation, and I would be delighted to hear what you now have to say. Ken? Thank you, Doug. Ken, are you there, please? Yes, we're yeah, here. There you are. Um, if any audience members have any questions for Dr. Ader here, um, just go ahead and type them in the question uh, box over in your GoToMeeting screen. Um, if not, then uh, you can feel free to uh, contact Doug Ader. His email is right on the screen. Or if you would like to contact me, um, it is C. Maddox, M-A-D-D-O-X, at examsoft.com. Either way, Doug, let's give it about one more minute to see if any questions pop up. And if not, then thank you. And I guess we can call this close. Well, my idea was to spend about a half hour presenting the results and then allowing and encouraging members of the audience to ponder the results, consider what they see, um, Con complicated ideas require processing time. And so to give them a little time to uh, formulate some questions, and then to let them know that, yes, I do have an e-dress, D-E-D-E-R, at S-I-U-E dot E-D-U. I am delighted to correspond with these people uh, either now or after the webinar is over. Uh, it's a beautiful day in southern Illinois, and the whole rest of the week is supposed to be like this. So I'd be happy to speak with them at any level that they would like. Um, starting with email, we can then go to telephone or even person to person if that uh, suits their fancy. But I'd be delighted to continue the conversation with them. What kind of questions have you uh, acquired? Doug, I have one. Yes. So the first one that came through is, um, what are your, uh, would you maybe have any suggestions for people doing it by hand? Did it seem to work for them or did they express maybe that they would like, you know, a more efficient way to conduct assessment at their school? Um, do I have any suggestions and to respond, uh, there are more uh, effective ways. Well, first of all, when I started doing assessment back in the 1980s, um, not only did I do it by hand, but the SIUE website was one of those used nationally. And I did it all by hand. We did HTML programming. Uh, I was one of the people who did that early on. And the SIUE website was one of the four national ones that were used as a resource for national assessment uh, concepts. 
uh, we were the site where uh, Tom Angelo's classroom assessment techniques was posted. So that was one of the resources that my university made available to the rest of the world. So yes, I did it all by hand. Um, I, I, I did the programming, and there are indeed are people who do it that way. Uh, is it possible? Sure, it's possible, uh, but it requires some dedication and a bit of computer facility in order to manage the statistics and the math. Now, are there more effective ways? There are many more effective ways. If one can put information into a database and manipulate the database, the power of doing the math and doing the statistics is greatly multiplied because instead of doing the calculations by hand, one pushes the button and the computer executes the program. So the data are not only calculated, but once you program the formatting, uh, they print out the way you like them um, in any format that you, uh, that you like. Uh, the nurses would be delighted to have this. Uh, they have seen it work, but they don't have the time, so they told me, to educate themselves to do this because as they spend time doing computer stuff, there are patients who don't have the opportunity to wait for care. So they can't put the patients on hold and they can't put the students on hold while they do the learning on the computer. So either the nurse has to take some sabbatical, which is a problem on its own right because medicine is continuing to advance. And so given the choice to learn computers versus to learn more oncology or allergy or hematology, the nurses tend to, to opt for the rapidly changing field of medicine. So my response is, is there a window or a gap? Yes. Are there more efficient ways to do it? Yes. Are they limping along? Yes. But they use such words as we're struggling with this. This is a bear. Um, this is painful. I'm quoting now. These are quotes. We're taking baby steps. It's a challenge. Uh, it's a mishmash. We're exploring for a good system and we're not there yet. So. They're limping along, but they need a great deal of help. In the meantime, they're getting it done. What else? Thank is that you. satisfactory? Is that is that appropriate? Is that too much? Is that too little? Um, I'll wait to see if the person that asked that question um, has a response to your own right there. Um, okay. Second question uh, is. What was the most surprising finding that you found? Just was there were, was there any that stuck out to you? Yes, and that is the question, the answer, or the response to the very first question: For whom are you doing this? To me, this was the definitive and uh, characteristic, characterizing response. We're doing it for our students, one hundred percent. That is every school that I interviewed said we're doing it for the students. And except for two, two of the 19, those responses were the first thing that they said. Two of the schools said we're doing it for our profession or we're doing it for ourselves first. And then said, and we're doing it for our students. But no one omitted the notion that we're doing it for our students. And they were definitive about it. And so what stuck out is these these schools are doing it for what those of us in the very beginnings of assessment thought were the right reasons. We're doing it for the students. We know that if we do this, the students will learn more effectively. And the accreditors can look over our shoulders, but we're not doing it for the accreditors. We're doing it for our students. That's what stuck out, 100%, no exceptions. Thank you. Other questions or comments? A third question that came through is mm -hmm. um, from what I can tell, um, this is from a fairly new program and they're thinking about best ways to begin the program and build a culture of assessment within their school. Um, do you have any suggestions or tips as to how they might do so? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, gee. 25 years of doing this, uh, let me think. Uh, yes, I think I think I have some examples. 
uh, the most effective program, and I've visited about 150 colleges and universities uh, from France across the United States, the Caribbean, Canada, to the Asia Pacific. And so with that chunk of the world that I have been privileged to visit and deal with in terms of assessment, um, by far the majority of those that have done well first start with a pilot program. Now, why pilot program? Pilot programs attract individuals and departments that want to get something done. And so it is not necessary to kick the behinds of the pilot programmers because those that start the pilot program have volunteered, especially if a person in higher administration says, we have this thing we wish to do and we would like to nominate from a group nominate this is a key word we would like to nominate from a group of hopefuls that lucky program lucky is again a good word that is going to receive assistance to get this job done who would like to who would like to apply for this honor and so smart administrators set up pilot programs that are available only to a selected part of the institution now off the record it's not necessarily a selected group, but the, the smart administrators start by making this an attraction. There's got to be some reward for it of one sort or another. It could be time, it could be money, it can be um, applause. But this pilot program then starts. The second part of a pilot program is that it is not something inflicted on an entire institution, which means that those that are interested don't have to pay attention to it at least initially. The third thing about a pilot program is that if it does die, it dies relatively quietly because it has not been vested in the entire institution. Only the volunteers are affected. And the fourth part of a pilot program is if it wins because it's a good idea, other programs will say they want the rewards as well and they will beg to come on. Uh, the best example I know about this is Cal State Northridge. Cal State Northridge started its assessment program after the Northridge earthquake. And the assessment person there and I talked about this and we worked together and she, she had these wonderful ideas and started with three programs at Cal State Northridge right after the earthquake when they were still uh, in offices of, uh, made out of tents. They were actually having offices in tents. Uh, and they started their assessment program. Three programs started, and with $1,500 per year as a reward. So they invested $4,500 total for the entire institution. And the next year, she had 30 programs clamoring to get into it. So pilot programs are the way I would recommend. I've just given you one example, but the many examples I have, I'm going to suggest Cal State Northridge had the best idea earliest. And that's one of the reasons that I think pilot programs are such good ideas. Thank you. Okay, another question that I got um, is, it seems like nursing schools kind of can serve as a model for best assessment practices. Are there any other types of colleges and schools that can also serve as models for best assessment practices? Yes. Um, if you're talking about the, t if, if the questioner is talking or asking about types of schools, uh, I would recommend pharmacy. Uh, pharmacy is another health-related uh, uh, school that involves undergraduate students. Now, the pharmacy schools are moving almost entirely to the doctor of pharmacy, a six-year degree, but they start with undergraduates, um, first-year students oftentimes, and those first year students have to undertake the general education, the communication, the critical thinking that is involved with other undergraduates. And so as a model, um, pharmacy is, a, is an excellent model. Uh, another group would be the veterinary schools. The veterinary schools, however, work at the graduate level. It's the infrequent undergraduate who gets into veterinary school. Uh, but the model of the veterinary school is, is transferable to the undergraduate. 
Um, business schools have the AACSB, the American Association, the Association for the Advancement of Colleges and Schools of Business, AACSB, and uh, engineering schools have ABET, um, the American Board of uh, Engineering and Technology. And both of those accrediting agencies, AACSB and ABET, have well-established protocols for assessment. Uh, and, and so those would be models. But I think I would start with pharmacy and the um, American Pharmacy Educators, APE, ACPE, American Associated Colleges of Pharmacy Educators, ACPE. Uh, I think I would start with those. Did that address the question? I believe it does. And I actually just got a yes from the person that asked it. So yes, that does address the question. Okay, Good. next Thank question you. is that I'm at a small liberal arts school. Um, how can I apply some, uh, I'm at a small liberal arts school that um, does not have clear cut standards for assessment by the accrediting body. How can I apply some uh, practices for assessment at my school? Um, this, I'm a little puzzled by the question. Uh, and the reason I'm puzzled is if this is a United States liberal arts college, then it is under the aegis of one of the six regional accreditors, uh, including North Central's Higher Learning Commission, or SACS, or NEOSC, which is Northeast, Middle States, WASC, or Northwest. And they all have standards for assessment. And therefore, and, and one cannot receive federal aid, even student aid, without being accredited by one of these six regional accreditors. Now, in the past, Hope College uh, in Michigan refused for its own reasons uh, regional accreditation. So unless this individual is from an unaccredited liberal arts college, which I doubt, then the axiom of the question is confusing to me. All accreditors, if it's an accredited institution, all of the six regional accreditors have expectations for accreditation. So I need some help to understand more of the nature of the question. OK. We can wait and see uh, when that person offers that help. Sure. Um, that, that was actually the last question I got, though, Doug. So okay. if, if you would like to go ahead and give it a minute and wait, or sure. perhaps maybe I can follow up with that person's answer. Um, Sure. With you after the web after we close out the webinar, which would you like to do? Um, let's look. Uh, these people have uh, gathered in rooms one way or another, or sat at a computer, willing to spend an hour of time, and I think that deserves respect. And so I'm not leaving until they do. <laughs> sure thing. Let's give it one minute, just so they can finish their. Sure. Just so they can respond back to you. Now, while we're waiting, I will say that I've worked with um, many liberal arts colleges. Uh, several are listed on the list of participants. And the one that I'm thinking about is Linfield College out in Oregon. Um, it's southwest of Portland. Uh, Linfield College, marvelous liberal arts college. And what they, and, and, and you introduced me as having spent time as a visiting scholar at, at uh, Hamilton College, and that's in upstate New York. Uh, these institutions are interested in producing students who succeed, who excel. Uh, I will then invoke, uh, speaking of a liberal arts college, uh, Loyola University in Chicago actually has a promise. And their promise is preparing students to lead extraordinary lives. Liberal arts colleges and private universities tend to like to go and express themselves is going farther than the public universities. And because of that, how do they show that their students have excelled? They can't just brag about it. They have to have evidence. Assessment provides that evidence. And so assessment is a wonderful way of helping a private institution show that it's doing more than the minimum. 
most of the private institutions that I've worked with use that as a lever. Okay, Dr. Ader, um, they responded. Sure. And it kind of goes back to a point that we have already discussed in this Q&A, and that is about building a culture of assessment. Um, they said, at our school, assessment is not one of the highest priorities, even though it's something we know we need to get done. So how do we yeah. make it a higher priority? <laughs> okay. Um, now, now I understand, uh, of course. Uh, the, the pilot project is, is, is really the, the, the key, at least in my experience. Uh, there are oftentimes departments. Uh, at private schools that are particularly good at doing something. And whatever it is that they're doing, it is almost automatically accessible. Um, one psychology department that I worked with, uh, the psychology department did not want to do assessment. It thought, this is terrible. Uh, it's, it's in our way. And the reason it's in our way is that our students have projects that they're doing as research with the faculty. And if you make us do assessment, we can't do our projects that are helping our students show how good they are. And at least as I worked with them, um, the first thing I did was try to disabuse them of the notion that assessment is standardized tests or the collecting of, quote, data, unquote. The conversation we had said, if these students are indeed doing projects. That means that they are doing critical thinking, they're making decisions, they're preparing an oral report, they're presenting at some sort of national or regional meeting, they're writing essays, and all these things are artifacts that can be used to assess their learning. And their learning includes decision making, oral communication, written communication, critical thinking. If these are important to you, use the senior project or the research with the faculty members as your assessment device. Don't create something new. Use that because that's what you're good at. 